Chapter Eleven of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Warm blood is a bond. Peculiarly enough, it was a matter of topography. The plateau which reached above the clouds rose with a steep slope from the valley from which a hunting spider's brood had driven the men. This was on the eastern edge of the plateau. On the west, however, the highland was subject to an indentation which almost severed it. Not more than twenty miles from where Burl's group had climbed the sunshine, there was a much more gradual slope downward. There, mushroom forests grew almost to the cloud layer. From there, giant insects strayed up and on to the plateau itself. They could not live above the clouds, of course. There was not food enough for their insatiable hunger. Especially at night, it was too cold to allow them to stay active. But they did stray from their normal environment, and some of them did reach the sunshine, and perhaps some of them blundered back down to their mushroom forests again. But those which did not stumble back were chilled to toper during their first night underneath the stars. They were only partly active on the second day, if indeed they were active at all. Few or none recovered from their second night's coldness. None at all kept their full ferocity and deadliness. And this was how the dogs survived. They were certainly descended from dogs on the wrecked spaceship, the Icarus, whose crew had landed on this planet some forty-odd human generations since. The humans of today had no memories of the ship, and the dogs surely had no traditions. But just because those early dogs had less intelligence, they had more useful instincts. Perhaps the first generation of castaways bred dogs in their first few desperate centuries, hoping that the dogs could help them survive. But no human civilization could survive in the lowlands. The humans went back to the primitive state of their race and lived as furtive vermin among monsters. Dogs could not survive there, though humans did linger on, so somehow the dogs took to the heights. Perhaps dogs survived their masters. Perhaps some were abandoned or driven away. But dogs had reached the highlands, and they did survive because giant insects blundered up after them and could not survive in a proper environment for dogs and men. There was even reason for the dogs remaining limited in number and keenly intelligent. The food supply was limited. When there were too many dogs, their attacks on stumbling insect giants were more desperate and made earlier, before the monster's ferocity was lessened. So more dogs died. Then there was an adjustment of the number of dogs to the food supply. There was also a selection of those too intelligent to attack rashly, yet those who had insufficient courage would not eat. In short, the dogs, who now regarded men with bright, interested eyes, were very sound dogs. They had the intelligence needed for survival. They did not attack anything imprudently. But they also knew that it was not necessary to be more than reasonably wary of insects in general, not even spiders, unless they were very newly arrived from the steaming lowlands. So the dogs regarded men with very much the same astonished interests with which the men regarded the dogs. Burl saw immediately that the dogs did not act with blind ferocity of insects, but with an interested estimative intelligence, strikingly like that of men. Insects never examined anything. They fled or they fought. Those who are not carnivorous had no interest in anything but food, and those who were meat-eaters lumbered insanely into battle at the bare sight of possible prey. The dogs did neither. They sniffed and they considered. Burl said sharply to his followers, Stay here. He walked slowly down into the amphitheater. Saya followed him instantly. Dogs moved warily aside, but they raised their noses and sniffed. They were long, luxurious sniffs. 
The smell of humankind was a good smell. Dogs had lived hundreds of their generations without having it in their nostrils. But before that, there were thousands of generations to whom that smell was a necessity. Burl reached the object the dogs had been attacking. It lay on the grass, throbbing painfully. It was the larva of an azure blue moth, which spread ten-foot wings at nightfall. The time for its metamorphosis was near, and it had traveled blindly in search of a place where it could spin its cocoon safely and change to its winged form. It had come to another world, the world above the clouds. It could find no proper place. Its stores of fat had protected it somewhat from the chill, but the dogs had found it as it crawled blindly. Burl considered. It was the custom of wasps to sting creatures like this at a certain special spot, apparently marked for them by a tuft of dark fur. Burl thrust home with his lance. The point pierced that particular spot. The creature died quickly and without agony. The thought to kill was an inspiration. Then instinct followed. Burl cut off meat for his tribesmen. The dogs offered no objection. They were well fed enough. Burl and Saya together carried the meat back to their other tribesfolk. On the way, Burl passed within two yards of a dog, which regarded him with extreme intentness, and almost a wistful expression. Burl's smell did not mean game. It meant something the dog struggled helplessly to remember. But it was good. I have killed the thing, said Burl to the dog, in the tone of one addressing an equal. You can go and eat it now. I took only part of it. Burl and his people ate of what he had brought back. Many of the dogs, most of them, went to the feast Burl had left. Presently they were back. They had no reason to be hostile. They were fed. The humans offered them no injury, and the humans smelled of something that appealed to the deepest wellsprings of canine nature. Presently the dogs were close about the humans. They were fascinated, and the humans were fascinated in return. Each of the people had a little of the feeling that Burl had experienced as the tribal leader. In the intent, absorbed and wholly unhostile regard of the dogs, even children felt flattered and friendly. And surely in a place where everything else was so novel and so satisfactory, it was possible to imagine friendliness with creatures which were not human, since assuredly they were not insects. A similar state of mind existed among the dogs. Saya had more meat than she desired. She glanced among the members of the tribe. All were supplied. She tossed it to a dog. He jerked away alertly, and then sniffed at it where it had dropped. A dog can always eat. He ate it. I wish you would talk to us, said Saya, hopefully. The dog wagged his tail. You do not look like us, said Saya, interestedly, but you act like we do, not like the monsters. The dog looked significantly at the meat in Burl's hand. Burl tossed it. The dog caught it with a quick snap, swallowed it, wagged his tail briefly, and came closer. It was a completely incredible action. But dogs and men were blood kin on this planet. Besides, there was racial memory, rightness, in the friendship between men and dogs. It was not hindered by any past experience of either. They were the only warm-blooded creatures on this world. It was a kinship felt by both. Presently Burl stood up and spoke politely to the dog. He addressed him with the same respect he would have given to another man. In all his life he had never felt equal to an insect, but he felt no arrogance toward this dog. He felt superior only to other men. We are going back to our cave, he said politely. Maybe we will meet again. He led his tribe back to the cave in which they had spent the previous night. The dogs followed, ranging on either side. They were well fed, with no memory of hostility to any creature which smelled of warm blood. They had an instinct 
without experience to dull it. The latter part of the journey back to the tribal cave was, if anybody had been qualified to notice it, remarkably like a group of dogs taking a walk with a group of people. It was companionable. It felt right. That night Burl left the cave as before to look at the stars. This time Saya went with him matter-of-factly. But as they came out of the cave entrance, there was a stirring. A dog rose and stretched himself elaborately, yawning the while. When Burl and Saya moved away, he trotted amiably with them. They talked to it, and the dog seemed pleased. It wagged its tail. When morning came, the dogs were still waiting, hopefully, for the humans to come out. They appeared to expect the people to take another nice long walk, on which they would accompany them. It was a brand new satisfaction they did not want to miss. After all, from a dog's standpoint, humans are made to take long walks with, among other things. The dogs greeted the people with tail waggings and cordiality. The dogs made a great difference in the adjustment of the tribe to life upon the plateau. Their friendship assured the new status of human life. Burl and his fellows had ceased to be furtive game for any insect murderer. They had hoped to become unpursued foragers, because they could hardly imagine anything else. But when the dogs joined them, they were immediately raised to the estate of hunters. The men did not domesticate the dogs, they made friends with them. The dogs did not subjugate themselves to the men. They joined them, at first tentatively, and then with worshipful enthusiasm. And the partnership was so inevitably a right one that within a month it was as if it had always been. Actually, save for a mere two thousand years, it had been. At the end of a month the tribe had a permanent encampment. There were caves at a suitable distance from the slope up which most wanderers from the lowlands came. Corey's oldest child found the chrysalis of a giant butterfly, whose caterpillar form had so offensive an odor that the dogs had not attacked it. But when it emerged from the chrysalis, men and dogs together assailed it before it could take flight. They ended the enterprise with warm mutual approval. The humans had acquired great wings with which to make warm cloaks, very useful against the evening chill. Dogs and men alike had feasted. Then one dawning, the dogs made a vast outcry, which awoke the tribesmen. Burl led the rush to the spot. They did battle with a monster nocturnal beetle, less chilled than most such invaders. In the gray dawnlight, Burl realized that the darting, yapping dogs kept the creatures full attention. He crippled and then killed it with his spear. The feat appeared to earn him warm admiration from the dogs. Burl wore a moth's feathery antenna again, bound to his forehead like a knight's plumes. He looked very splendid. The entire pattern of human life changed swiftly, as if an entire revelation had been granted to men. The ground was often thorny. One man pierced his foot. Old Tama, scolding him for his carelessness, bound a strip of wing fabric about it so he could walk. The injured foot was more comfortable than the one still unhurt. Within a week the women were busily contriving diverse forms of footgear to achieve greater comfort for everybody. One day Saya admired glistening red berries and tried to pluck one, and they stained her finger. She licked her fingers to clean them, and berries were added to the tribe's menu. A veritable orgy of experiment began, which is a state of things which is extremely rare in human affairs. A race with an established culture and tradition does not abandon old ways of doing things without profound reason. But men who have abandoned their old ways can discover astonishingly useful new ones. Already the dogs were established as sentries and watchmen. 
and as friends to every member of the tribe. By now, mothers did not feel alarmed if a child wandered out of sight. There would be dogs along. No danger could approach a child without vociferous warnings from the dogs. Men went hunting now, with zestful, tail-wagging dogs as companions in the chase. Dor killed a torpid minotaur beetle alone, save for assisting dogs, and Burl felt a twinge of jealousy. But then Burl himself battled a black male spider in a lone duel, with dogs to help. By the time the stray monster from the lowlands reached this area, it was dazed and half numbed by one night of continuous chill. Even the black spider could not find the energy to leap. It fought like a fiend, yet sluggishly. Burl killed this one, while the dogs kept it busy, and the dogs were reproachful because he carried it back to the tribal headquarters before dividing it among his assistants. Afterward, he realized that though he could have avoided the fight, he would have been ashamed to do so, while the dogs barked and snapped at its furry legs. It was while things were in this state that the way of life for human beings on the Forgotten Planet was settled for all time. Burl and Saya went out early one morning with the dogs to hunt for meat for the village. Hunting was easiest in the early hours while creatures that strayed up the night before were still sluggish with cold. Often hunting was merely butchery of an enfeebled monster to whom any effort at all was terribly difficult. This morning they strode away briskly. The dogs roved exuberantly through the brush before them. They were some five miles from the village when the dogs bade game, and Burl and Saya ran to the spot with ready spears, which was something of a change from their former actions on notice of a carnivore abroad. They found the dogs dancing and barking around one of the most ferocious of the meat-eating beetles. It was not unduly large, to be sure. Its body might have been four feet long, or thereabouts, but its horrible gaping mandibles added a good three feet more. Those sigh-like weapons gaped wide, opening sideways, as insect jaws do, as the beetle snapped hideously at its attackers, swinging about as the dogs dashed at it. Its legs were spurred and spiked and armed with dagger-like spines. Burl plunged into the fight. The great mandibles clicked and clashed. They were capable of disemboweling a man or snapping a dog's body in half without effort. There were whistling noises as the beetle breathed through its abdominal spiracles. It fought furiously, making ferocious charges at the dogs who tormented and bewildered it, but they created the most zestfully excited of tumults. Burl and Saya were, of course, at least as absorbed and excited as the dogs, or they would have noticed the thing that was to make so much difference to every human being, not only on the plateau, but still down in the lowlands. This unnoticed thing was beyond their imagining. They had been nothing else like it on this world for many hundreds of years. It was a half a dozen miles away and perhaps a thousand feet high when Burl and Saya prepared to intervene professionally on the behalf of the dogs. It was a silvery needle floating unsupported in the air. As they entered the battle, it swerved and moved swiftly in their direction. It was silent, and they did not notice. They knew of no reason to scan the sky in daytime and there was business on hand anyhow. Burl leaped in toward the beetle with a lance thrust at the tough integument where an armored leg joined the creature's body. He missed, and the beetle whirled. Saya flashed her cloak before the monster so that it seemed a larger and nearer antagonist. As the creature whirled again, Burl stabbed, and a hind leg crumpled. Instantly the thing was limping. A beetle does not use its legs like four-legged creatures. A beetle moving shifts the two end legs on one side 
and the central leg on the other, so that it always stands on an adjustable tripod of limbs. It cannot adjust readily to crippling. A dog snatched at a spiny lower leg and crunched and darted away. The machine-like monster uttered a formless, deep bass cry and was spurred to unbelievable fierceness. The fight became a thing of furious movement and joyous uproar, with Burl striking once at a multiple eye so the pain would deflect it from a charge at Saya, and Saya again deflecting it with her cloak and once breathlessly trying to strike it with her shorter spear. They struck it again, and a third time, and it sank horribly to the ground, all three legs on one side crippled. The remaining three thrust and thrust and struggled senselessly, and suddenly it was on its back, still striking its gigantic jaws frantically, in the hope of murder. But then Burl struck home, between two armor plates, where a ganglion was almost exposed. The blow killed it instantly. Burl and Saya were smiling at each other when there was a monstrous sound of crashing trees. They whirled. The dogs picked up their ears. One of them barked defiantly. Something huge, truly huge, had settled to the ground, a bear two hundred yards away. It was metal, and there were ports in its sides. And it was quite beyond imagining, because, of course, no spaceship had landed on this planet in forty-odd human generations. A port opened as they stared at it. Men came out. Burl and Saya were barbarically attired, but they had been fighting some sort of local monster. The men on the spaceship could not quite grasp what they had seen, and they had been helped by dogs. Human beings and dogs together always meant some sort of civilization. The dogs gave an impression of a very high level indeed. They trotted confidently over to the ship, and they sniffed cautiously at the men who had landed. Their behavior was admirable. They greeted the newcome men with the self-confident cordiality of dogs who were on the best possible terms with human beings, and there was no question of any suspicion by anybody. The attitude of a man toward a dog is a perfectly valid indication of his character, if not of his technical education, and the newcomers knew how to treat dogs. So Burl and Saya went forward with the confident pleasure with which well-raised children and other persons of innate dignity greet strangers. The ship was the Walpity, a private cruiser doing incidental exploration for the biological survey in the course of a trip after good hunting. It had touched on the forgotten planet, and it would never be forgotten again. End of chapter 11